Many thanks for choosing us. Government has placed the ban on the use of V8 and V6 vehicles by officials effective January 2023. This is among other measures announced by the Finance Minister Kano Furiata during the 2023 budget presentation on Thursday, November 24, to cut down on government expenditure. However, the use of such vehicles will be permitted for travels outside Accra. A ban on the use of V8 and V6 or its equivalent except for cross-country travel. All government vehicles will be registered with GV green number plates from January 2023. Also, the purchase of new vehicles will be restricted to locally assembled ones. What difference will this make? How practical is the initiative in terms of enforcement? And how much is that likely to save the public purse? Joining me uh, via Zoom is Ben Boache, is Executive Director of the Africa Center for Energy Policy. I'm grateful for your time, Mr. Boache. Um, thanks for having me, Aisha. First, what's your general assessment of how government intends to deal with the high expenditure? One is to cut the use of V8 and V6 vehicles for intercity travel. What impact will this make? Yeah, I think at this point, um, every little helps. Uh, every little cut um, is relevant uh, for us to be able to consolidate and you know salvage the economy from uh, its current uh, state. So on that score, you would appreciate what the finance minister uh, is trying to do. Um, I'm not sure how practical uh, this will be this time around. Uh, we have seen similar directives uh, in the past. Um, for example, ministers uh, being instructed not to travel. And yes, they were traveling all over the place. Uh, and those directives even came from the presidency. Uh, I've seen two letters from the chief of staff in the past, but it didn't stop ministers from traveling. Uh, those bans were never lifted. But ministers were traveling. Uh, uh, CEOs of agencies uh, have been traveling. How do they even track that? It's very difficult. And how do you ensure that even if you're not giving them coupons, you're not using other uh, you know, resources in the ministries to also buy the fuel uh, to be able to move their cars. Uh, and those are things that we will track uh, over time. But if it is implemented and, you know, this time around, efficiently monitored, uh, it could save uh, some resources. Were your expectations met in terms of how we intend to deal with our energy debt? I'm not sure. Um, I was looking forward to seeing you know, strategic measures uh, to deal with the recurrence and accumulation of debt uh, in the energy sector. Uh, I didn't see that. Um, already this year, uh, so much debt has been accumulated. Uh, the outstanding debt to the energy sector uh, players is in excess of a billion dollars. Uh, we are in arrears on uh, gas payments, um, letters of credits have been drawn down. And at the same time, we are still accumulating that. So I was hoping that we would see a strategic uh, communication, uh, you know, to deal with the debt accumulation and how we're going to be able to, uh, you know, pay for the debt. I don't know whether the haircuts or the debt restructuring will also affect uh, the IPPs, but I mean, it, it is a very worrying uh, situation uh, at this point where the power sector in particular is not able to recover uh, its debt. Uh, we are told that a new tariff is going to come. Um, we didn't hear any detail on that and how you know the tariff will be used to be able to mop up some uh, revenue uh, to pay some of the debt and also uh, make the sector more sustainable and lift the burden off. Uh, government, you know, as we've seen in recent past. Where does that leave us now? More tariffs to be paid uh, for electricity? Um, is that where we are now? No, certainly we, we're going to have to pay for more uh, for electricity, um, especially where we are not making, you know, enough effort to really stop the leakages in the sector. What it means is that many more people uh, will keep stealing power, uh, they will not pay for it. 
and the few that are responsible uh, would, you know, be built to pay more uh, to be able to keep the sector uh, running. When you have such a situation, you're going to have more people slipping uh, into the inefficiency bracket and then deepening, uh, 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 you know, the debt obligation on the state. So we need to really have, you know, an efficient utility like ECG that can uh, collect revenue, ensure that people are punished, uh, stop the leakages uh, in the space. But again, I mean, there is no strategy uh, to do that. You remember when the PDS didn't fail, the Ministry of Finance consistently promised that they were going to bring up a new structure that allows investment to be able to track the inefficiencies and improve distribution of electricity. Um, we haven't seen that happen, and the waste continues to pile up. Uh, and we are paying billions a year. That is way higher than the savings that we are hoping to get by just restricting the movement of, you know, CEOs and ministers, which is be much more difficult to track, uh, you know, in such circumstances. So um, I don't know how we deal with that subsequently, and also maybe through the engagement with the IMF, a more credible uh, solution will come. Uh, through that process, but the budget didn't really provide answers to how we lift ourselves uh, from the inefficiencies in the energy sector. I'm grateful for your time this afternoon. Ben Bocci is the uh, executive director of the Energy Center, Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP. Meanwhile, Professor John Gachi, Dean of School of Business at the University of Cape Coast, says the government is not being truthful with Ghanaians over the planned debt sustainability it intends to undertake. Joy News understands government is set to suspend interest payments for domestic bondholders and impose a 30% haircut on foreign bonds. Deputy Finance Minister John Kuma explained that under the debt restructuring arrangement, domestic bondholders will receive zero interest for 2023. But the ministry says the processes have not concluded. There's a statement released by the finance minister and I'll be sharing um, assets with you and it says the ministry following uh, provides the following updates on the progress of technical work on possible debt operators operation as part of ongoing negotiations with International Monetary Fund the IMF this update follows a statement made on the Sides of the presentation of 2023 budget in Parliament. As stated in the budget speech by the Minister, uh, Government of Ghana is contemplating a debt operation aimed at um, alleviating the pressures on the national budget and restoring debt sustainability. This would also open up finance streams and provide needed balance of payment support from the fund. And it goes on to say details of the different layers of the debt operation, including the terms of principal payments and interest on the public debt are still being discussed. Government uh, reiterates its commitment to rolling out a lasting solution to the current economic challenges. Now, reacting to this release from the Minister of Finance, Professor John Gachi said government is not being truthful. He spoke on news desk. It's, it's clearly debt restructuring with all its forms. Uh, you are losing uh, on the maturity. So the maturity is extended. Uh, interest is lost. So the two elements of debt restructuring are all in place. Uh, but look at who is talking. The one who has, uh, in, who is indebted to uh, the financial institutions, etc., to uh, bondholders, mm. as, and, and so forth and so on, uh, is the one who is claiming that he's, he has uh, now put in place policy to stop uh, investors from receiving interest. Uh, we have not heard of any negotiation. So it's like a bullying tactics. And well, but, but the finance uh, ministry says that we have not finished the process. When we are done, we will give the update. So it looks like what the deputy minister said is not what's going to happen. That's what the statement wants to clarify, isn't it? I'm not sure about that. Mm. I'm not sure about that. And again, I think what the deputy minister said that it's a debt exchange program is totally false. 
what are you exchanging the debt for? When you are exchanging something, you exchange A for B. Uh, in this case, what are we exchanging for? So it's purely debt restructuring and people are receiving the heavy haircut that uh, is meted out to them. Uh, that is simply the case. I don't know why the government is afraid talking about debt restructuring. Okay. My colleague Papa Nia Shale has been engaging some business owners at Abusu Kine and has filed this report on the uh, budget. Um, I have one, uh, one lady here who is uh, one of the avid uh, members of the Spare Pass Dealers Association. She's also here in Abusu Kine. Brenda, Brenda, uh, your full name though? Brenda Adufu. Okay, Brenda. So. You, you've heard partly what the minister was able to say. One of the few people that are interested, first of all, in what the minister had to say. I mean, first of all, what, what was your initial assessment of what the finance minister said? Okay, so basically what is in there that is most important to us traders is the tax elements, the increments in the VAT. Um, I think it's very insensitive to increase VAT at this time. So already this is the issue we are battling with. Bottom line, you are looking at over a thousand cities for one piece of battery to get to your shop. And your markup hasn't even come to talk of the VAT elements. At the end of the day, how do you expect the everyday user to buy 115 plates of battery? I think it is very, very insensitive. The, the, the things are that tough to, to come in overburdening us with um, more taxes. And that even e levy thing, the reduction, they should just scrap the whole thing off. Um, I have Eric, he's the PRO of the Spare Pass Dealers Association right here um, in Abu Sokaim. Um, Eric, so you didn't want to hear it, but it's been announced 2.5% more on your VAT um, at the port and in the business that are going to be doing. How do you react to that? I think uh, it is an unfortunate situation. We, we do, we were having some. Uh, um, some information that you know, something of that sort to happen. Uh, it's quite unfortunate because uh, we were we sent a strong signal to the government that uh, we are not in position to receive this. But you know, as it stands, it has come. And then, uh, what else will you do? It has. It, it is. You know, it's only adding up to the economic hardship of the Ghanaian citizenry. I think there was some little hope there that you were saying that you sort of reduce the exemptions on foreign uh, uh, on, on foreign companies. Ah, we hoping we hoping that there will be that because you know as it stands we we, we can't compete uh, with, with, with set companies and then uh, if he he has seen the need to cut down that foreign exemptions uh, some exemptions on foreign goods. I think uh, that one uh, is laudable. That was laudable. Eric. Let's now show you the exact measures outlined to show up Ghana's struggling economy. Right there on your screens, uh, you would see that the uh, 2023 budget announced a number of uh, revenue measures and it said value-added tax will be increased from 12.5% to 15%. E-levy rates will be reduced to 1% while the daily threshold will be removed. The 1% concessional rates will be increased to 5%. There is more also in that budget just to show up revenue. Now, it says taxes on cigarettes and tobacco products will be revised. Excise rates for spirits will be revised above that of beers. Electronic smoking devices and liquids will be taxed. And uh, there's also more. Uh, that's government intends to do. And it says the benchmark discount policy will be fully phased out in 2023 and those are some of the uh, revenue measures uh, presented by the finance minister in the budget yesterday now patrons of the made in kumasi edition of the government's planting for food and jobs market have expressed disappointment in the turnout of events they say the commodities a few bags of local rice some vegetables and gari are expensive compared to the ones sold on the market after a long wait for the market to start the pickup full of food items which arrived at the venue were limited lava firms mona lisa frimpo has more in this report
Welcome back to Join News today. To the rest of our stories, farmers around the eastern corridor of the northern region have expressed worry they might lose their rice farms to bushfire following the unavailability of combined harvesters for harvest. There are limited combined harvesters in the region, making it difficult for farmers to get to rain for their harvest. According to the farmers, those who are fortunate to find one are complaining of the astronomical charges. Owners of combined harvesters are charging about 600 Ghana cities to harvest an acre of rice. The farmers are worried now because hunters have begun burning bushes to clear the field for hunting. Most of them have suffered losses through bushfires. Bush burning is an annual exercise hunters engage in the area. Thousands of acres of farmland have been lost to bushfires. Today we visit the farms of students of the 7 A's College of Science and Technology who are raising against time to harvest their rice. The school is lucky to have a harvester to harvest their rice, but it had had to travel all the way from Savilgu to Yendi, about 130 kilometers for the harvest. School prefect of the school, Nathan Kofi, said the entire school was brought in to help pick the rice that had fallen due to over dryness. I'm the school prefect of my school and I'm here with my colleague students to help harvest the rice. We are here today because our rice have over dried because due to our inability to get the combined harvester on time. And when we came here, we were able to pick some amount of rice from the ground and we are grateful to the person who gave us the combined harvester. Founder of the school, Nathaniel Adams Jr. said farm machinery for plowing and harvesting in the area is a challenge, adding that when one manages to plow and it's time for harvesting, they go through same challenges to harvest. It's an annual challenge having a combined harvest. Plowing in itself is a problem, but when you are done, especially for the rice, having a harvester to come and harvest and um, all the dry we all practice uh, rain season farming and so all the rice is virtually dried around the same time and so um, you don't have enough combined harvesters to help harvest the rice and what happens mostly is that they start drying and once they dry they fall off um, this is our school farm we've lost almost about a third and if we don't we, we are not uh, we're not able to harvest it at this time um, the fire would come and if we are not lucky we'll lose the whole farm and it's been an annual thing that every year you struggle to get a combined harvester to come in and help harvest the whole area um, this belt this is thing belt here there is no combined harvester so farmers are always um, running and following to see where they will get a harvester to help them harvest their rice. Abdullahi Bawa is a farmer within the enclave and he said he heard the sound of the harvester and traced to the 7 A's college school farm. Mr. Bawa said last year he lost 12 acres of his rice farm due to bushfire. Last year I was able to farm about 20 acres of rice. Getting combined to harvest it was not easy. I could follow a number of combined. At the end of it, I was not able to succeed. So it got to a time that I decided, and then let me go back and use a manual means in order to harvest my rice. So when I went in for the manual, they were able to finish about eight acres. It was not trash. So we were in the farm when they start, 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 uh, started shed, uh, setting on fires. So almost about 12 acres of my rice was burned by the fire. Patrons of the Made in Kumasi edition of the government's planting for food and jobs market have expressed disappointment in the turnout of events. They say the commodities, a few bags of local rice, some vegetables and gari, are expensive, are expensive compared to the ones sold on the market. After a long wait for the market to start, the pickup full of food items which arrived at the venue were limited. Lava Femme's Mona Lisa Frimpon has more in the following report. At 7 a.m. in the morning, some patrons had gathered at the Prempe Assembly Hall in Kumasi in anticipation of government's planting for food and jobs market. 
Some who had traveled from far and near were expecting to buy low-priced commodities introduced by the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. However, after several hours of waiting, there seemed to be no sign of the food commodities. It may be do her round nine. Any action, I'm a pin sabri. One more country and say, In your name, Eba. Any action, I'm feeling a meadum amber. I at last, I'm a bar sinner, and almost say, Omohia, will be catching us almost a Ghana card. In Tiamayas, I'll crack coffee, a coffee abo, near Cofagana card. At midday, a Toyota pickup loaded with bags of rice, spinach, lettuce, carrot and spring onions was spotted heading to the grounds. But patrons were dissatisfied as they were expecting a variety of staple foods. Even I was coming to buy a plantain and I've been waiting for it since from morning and it hasn't come yet. So when I saw the rice then I decided to buy the rice, rice and go home. Me by say even kometo a mo nanka may be an agene and ne and what be a beca nanka my tom and him say be a new ma be bre be bentin can me fresh say be who said no man draw nami who dear me pa nanka mato but ya unko sa in tinache say was some more nanka sana meto name de echo. Customers say the commodities are highly priced. They expressed surprise at the supposed affordable commodities, which they say are high compared to similar ones sold at market centers in Kumasi. I came here purposely for the rice, but the price that they are quoting, 70 cities for 4.5 kg, I think it's, it's a little bit dear. So uh, I've bought this, this is uh, cabbage. The price is five. I used to buy this type of organic ones at the, the KNUST greenhouse for between eight and ten cities. So five is okay. I didn't make I said, I I said, I said, I said, I I I but the Ministry of Food and Agriculture says the prices are not as high as the patrons suggest. Reverend John Menu is the Ashanti Regional Director of Agriculture. Uh, carols, it's been sold over here, a bag. It's about 20 cities. But when it gets outside the open market, it's more than, it's from 225. 25 to 30 cities. We are saying that if we continue this exercise, people will realize that produce over here is affordable. They will come. And as they come, people will not be going to the open market, right? And it will force them also to reduce their price. Reverend John Menu says the initiative is to persuade traders in the open market to reduce prices of their food items. They believe this will make it affordable for all. And all, all that we are doing, not that we want to support people's business, but we want people to be considerate, right? So that at least, if you are going to get 100% profit, get about 50 to 75 and let the consumer have a briefing space. Mona Lisa Frimpon reporting. The National Lottery Authority has defended its decision to compel lotto operators to pay a 20% commission instead of the 30% the lotto writers are calling for. You'll recall that last month, lotto writers across Ghana warned of massive demonstrations across the country should the NLA decide to hold on to its decision. But the NLA says agreeing to that will be against the laws that established it. Samir Wuko is the Director General of the NLA. They wrote to the NLA and its management 
I think in the past few weeks, you've had the, the, the very heat that the operations of the NLA has generated, leading to the NLA embarking on swoops to weed out illegals in the system. And this we have not reneged on our promise. However, uh, when they wrote to us, we decided to listen to their concerns. The, the, it's, it is a special operation we are embarking upon. One to without the illegals. If you are not registered or licensed to operate, you won't operate. It's fundamental. Because the, what governs between us and these local operators, that relationship is governed by the license agreement you sign with them. Those license agreements come with its own conditions. And we have been clear in what these agreements entail. And this is what they signed up for. And so we also want to repeat and make it clear to them as well that uh, they should comply. Again, they have also accepted that it's the NLA that has the sole mandate to also regulate the lottery industry. We have also made it clear to them today that as much as possible, we have to work with each other and cooperate. We do not have any direct relationship with them, but we have it with the PLOs, and the PLOs employ them. However, our decisions and policies on uh, the PLOs will also affect them. Once they've come, we've also made it clear that NLA has at no point in time fixed commission rate at 30%, which they agreed. But they said it's been a practice. We, they've also been shown evidence that the PLO signed up to 20% commission two years ago, last year, and this year. So the fact that the PLOs were engaging in things of illegality does not mean that it is a right for them, which they've understood. Samir Oku says they will, however, consider reviewing its operations to accommodate the request by the little operators whilst they wait on the decision of the NLA board concerning the payment of commissions. On the issue of the NLA reviewing its operation and toning down on when our task force go out, breaking of the chaos and all, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a something that we've taken notice of it. We'll investigate and then we'll make sure that such things are averted. It's like the PLOs have parried this thing onto you. You are not yeah, supposed to have. Later. Yes, but this is a contract they have with their writers. Yeah. Why not go ahead so to... the contract to... that they have with their writers, I can be dead sure that it's not a written contract between them and the writers. I'm sure it's been by word of... However, ours, between us and the PLOs, is governed by a license agreement. So... They have a matter with the PLOs, but the PLOs are licensed by us. So it's important that we listen to them. So I was just saying that if it's a contract between you and the PLOs, why not go ahead to revoke the contract if, if someone the is... The PLOs are complying now. So that's why the PLOs don't want to be in default. So they are complying. They don't want to err on the side of the NLS Act and on the law, because they know. So the writers who are not understanding why the PLOs are also bent on complying, because we license the PLOs. And their inability to also comply by the board's decisions and the rules and regulations, they know that it will affect their license for the 2023 and beyond. With this heat, can we see a slight increment going, going into next year? I don't want to say yes or no, but because I don't have the power to do that. I can't decide for the board. However, I'm sure the board always takes decisions based on uh, uh, best practices and prevailing circumstances. If you look at across the world, that of several countries that we mentioned, Ghana is the highest. So meaning that already it is a problem for the World Lottery Association. Ghana's commission rate is a problem for the World Lottery Association and for the African Lottery Association. And any time we go for such conferences and all, they express this worry. So meaning that any increment we have to also carefully think through and weigh it side by side what the WLA and the African Lottery Association are also telling us and see what we can do. Ewoko is Director General of the National Lotteries Authority. We'll take a break on joining us today. When we return, we'll bring you the very latest coming from the world of business. <laughs> Good afternoon, it's time to do business with me, Beverly.
Broom, Open Forum on Agricultural Biotechnology in Africa, OFAB, has organized a workshop for clergymen to educate them on the benefits of biotechnology for Ghana and clarify issues about the technology. Speaking at the training, research scientist at the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, Dr. Daniel Oselfus, who indicated that religious leaders play a vital role in the level of acceptance of genetically modified organisms by the public. Research scientists believe it is appropriate that the nation facilitates the processes for the acceptance of biotechnology to enhance food security given the emerging threats to agricultural productivity. However, most Ghanaians are not receptive of the idea of consuming genetically modified organisms. Scientists are optimistic that constant education will help change the perception. Hence, the Open Forum on Agricultural Biotechnology technology in Africa held a training session for religious leaders. Previously, um, when you speak um, this kind of science, um, it's a no-go area for them. But today, after my presentation, I could realize that they have understood the technology. Most of the time, people uh, behave in a certain way when they don't understand the, 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 the issue. So after my presentation, I realized that most of them are receptive to the technology and um, from the body language I saw um, they have understood that it is a way that scientists are helping to make food available for all of us. After a few presentations some participants of the workshop pledged to pass on the knowledge acquired to their congregants. With this knowledge I could you know use some of them as illustrations and through that, you know, I could pass on the information to them. And also by putting together forums that I could invite the facilitators to come and also, you know, propagate the information about GNO. Of course, I was discussing with one of the organizers whether it's possible to have him speak to the university, the Methodist University community, and of course, my parish, you know, about GMOs. I have just had a days of presentation, which I understand. So you have, if I have the opportunity, I'll call the experts to come and then do justice to the topic for my congregants. I think that all hands should be on deck to make sure that GMO is embraced so that we can act have um, a very good yield going forward. Meanwhile, Principal Investigator of PBR Kalpi at the CSIR Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, Dr. Jerry Imbonyine, shared the status of work done on the GM crop. So for the PBR, um, let me say PBR BT Kalpi in Ghana, we now have a permit for environmental release. And because we have that permit, we've started multi-locational trials in the whole of northern Ghana. So we have trials that were set up in the five regions to introduce the material to farmers. Farmers planted it for the first time on their farm and they were able to experience how the plant um, performs. They saw the yield advantage of that particular cowpea compared to the traditional ones that they have. So, so far, that's, this is where we are, and we are hoping that after this year's um, work, we should be able to prepare to apply for varietal release with the National Varietal Release Committee. Moving on, the Deputy Commissioner for Shraj, Messi Labi, has announced that a business-related human rights policy will be rolled out by the middle of next year. Speaking at the National Action Plan Conference in Accra, she said the plan is to reduce human rights abuses associated with businesses. There's more in the following report. The National Action Plan, inaugurated in 2021 by Schwarz, in collaboration with major stakeholders in the business industry, is aimed at enhancing Ghanaian businesses to meet international standards with respect to human rights. Victor Kwekubrobe, chairperson of the National Steering Committee, in a presentation explained that Schwarz will adapt project assessment mechanisms to ensure that people's rights are not abused at the workplace. The, the human rights due diligence, which will be mandatory, um, will be monitored by Shraj, and Shraj will um, develop a process by which it will be able to rate the extent to which a company 
um, takes into account human rights when it is um, undertaking its operations and even develop a rating system um, for various companies to indicate their levels of compliance. So um, in addition to uh, just having the, the input assessment, Shraj will be able to tell you whether you are a, a grade A or AA or a B plus level um, human rights um, compliance entity. He also mentioned that the implementation of the policy will enable Ghanaian workers seek legal actions when their rights are being infringed upon at the workplace. Um, and so we are hoping that this process would at the very least develop a, a legal regime that would allow for ordinary Ghanaians at all levels um, to be able to indicated that the plan was in collaboration with key stakeholders of the industry to find an effective approach to the compliance of the policy. The proposals, if they go all over the country and it's accepted, compliance, like before you start your business, before they register your business, come to Shraj and let's see, let's assess your human rights, let's see your human rights policies in your document before your business is registered. Before the government gives you a contract, go to Shraj and get a human rights certificate, compliance certificate. So you come and we assess your businesses and look at your human rights issues and then we'll give you human rights compliance certificates before the contract is given to you. So if we put that in place and you come and Shraj is accessing you, you have to know that yes, you are looking at this, you are doing that and that you are human rights compliant, therefore you can't conduct business in the country. Maria Jelenate, the director in charge of human rights at Shraj, called on stakeholders to help in the effective implementation of the policy. The National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights is to ensure that corporate institutions also have their role to play when it comes to enjoyment of human rights. In the sense that sometimes the work they do impacts on the enjoyment of rights of the communities they operate in. And so we are uh, developing this plan to mitigate the human rights impacts communities and to provide a guide towards ensuring that some of the human rights violations may not even happen again. A report by Stephen Mensah and Esther Inkroma. That's all for business. We have more business when you log on to myjoyonline.com for slash business. My name is Beverly Broom. And time for sports now. Ghana's coach Otto Addo has criticized the American referee who awarded the penalty that resulted in Portugal's opener against the Black Stars. It was a goalless first half before the match official controversially pointed to the sport following a challenge from Salisu Mohamed on a Cristiano Ronaldo. Otto Addo was left fuming at the decision. Surely we are very disappointed, um, especially when I see the penalty situation. I think uh, up to that point, we really had a good match. Um, ball possession was on Portugal. We knew that they were good. Um, we didn't play our counters that well, but I think we defended well and allowed less chances. And yeah, I was hoping that second half, when they push more, we will have more space. Um, but when they scored the goal, the game changed. Um, I think it was a really wrong decision. We are playing the ball and uh, surely there's contact afterwards. But um, yeah, I don't know why Wa didn't come up. I, it's no explanation for me. Um, yeah, and then it's difficult.
good against a world class team when they are leading. Um, it's very very difficult to play against them, but uh, um, yeah, we were brave. We, we we tried as much. We we scored two goals. We always came back. Um, so yeah, first of all. Um, it was a tactical change. He had a, a yellow card, and um, I was I had a little bit fear that he can't go into the duels how I wanted um, to. So I took him off um, to bring a fresh player also, and this was the reason. And um, yeah, uh, I don't think it had a big impact because that uh, moment it was um, actually um, one one, and. Um, yeah, the, the game was hectic. We we made some few mistakes, which uh, where we allowed the, the second and the, and the third goal. Um, had to close the lines, um, uh, open the lines to to for, to, for them to, to pass it, and yeah, they used it, and um, yeah, was yeah a little bit unlucky. Listen, a little bit unlucky. Like I said, uh, with a little bit of luck, we could have reached one point. Um, referee was not in, a, in our favor, even. They could do, in my view, our yellow cards were deserved. But uh, for me, holding jerseys, stopping counter tech with holding jersey, holding a jersey, it's also a yellow card. And I don't know what was wrong, um, but uh, he was really not in our favor. Captain Andrea Yu, who was on target in the encounter, has assured Ghanaians the Black Stars will bounce back strongly in their next match against South Korea. Our game plan was working really well, but in the first half we were not um, giving them enough threat behind. But we were solid. They were having a lot of the ball, but they were having um, clear chances. We know what kind of squad they are. We didn't see the penalty, but from outside it looked a bit... I don't know, I don't want to... Because I didn't see it on, on, on video, and the penalty changed the course of the game, but... After that, we came back into the game, 1-1, one, one. and then uh, we considered two goals in what, five in the space of three, five minutes. That cha changed the game. That shows that high level, we can't switch off. But uh, I'm very confident what I saw. I have a lot of belief, and I believe that uh, if we continue like this and we tweak in some little things, we, we can hopefully get the, the three points uh, in, the, in the next game. And obviously it was disappointing to concede the penalty, but then you showed a lot of heart to get the equaliser. What did you learn about your team in adversity? I know my team. I know that I know how we got to the World Cup. It was very difficult and we went through so many difficult periods. So I always believe that we can always come out of difficult situations. Close, close to it today, we nearly came out from a tough one. But we know that when we do such mistakes versus a, a, a team like Portugal, you pay it cash. But we're quite solid. We showed a lot. We need to stay calm. Go, 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 go home. Relax. Correct uh, what we did wrong. And increase our performance uh, on the next game. Andrea, you coach of the Blacks captain of the Black Stars, and that's how we wrap up the bulletin this afternoon. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Many thanks for watching. Log on to myjohnline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. Do enjoy the rest of our programs.